Hey everyone, Morgan here. So we're going to be looking at the first few pages of the lecture outline dealing with light. And this is going to be a discussion of a little bit of physics that's necessary for us to understand things like spectroscopy. And we're going to introduce background information today about waves. So what is a wave? A wave is a disturbance traveling through a medium, okay? And we could be talking about water waves, sound waves, or electromagnetic radiation light waves. All of these rules are pretty much going to be followed for them, okay? Now, there are two categories of waves that you'll learn about in your physics book. One is called a longitudinal wave, which looks like this, where the displacement and the velocity of propagation are the same. So it's waving left to right, and it's traveling left to right, or actually it's right in this diagram, okay? So this would be like a sound wave, or certain types of earthquakes, or a slinky that's just flat on the tabletop going back and forth, which is not a terribly entertaining slinky, okay? So the displacement of the medium is in the same direction as the propagation of the wave. And that's pretty much the last we need to think about longitudinal waves. They're not terribly relevant to a chemistry class. We're more interested in a transverse wave. Now, a transverse wave goes up and down, where it's waving, that's the disturbance, but it moves at a right angle to that. The direction of displacement of the medium is perpendicular to the direction of travel. Now, this is really a nice, I mean, a really nice diagram of what the wave is going to look like. And you've got this in your lecture outline. So it's going to help you a great deal with understanding all the definitions we're going to be getting into. So let's fill in this table. We'll talk about wavelength first. It's given the symbol, la symbol lambda, Greek letter. I recommend you print out a, a page that's got uh, a list of the Greek letters and their names. Put it in your notebook. It'll be helpful. The unit is the meter or some derivative of the meter. It can be centimeters, nanometers. We're going to use nanometers a lot. Actually, so you should be aware of that one. And it's the distance between two consecutive wave crests or troughs. Hopefully, you actually remember this from last year. And any of you that have been coming to ChemX, you actually saw us talking about this a great deal. Frequency is given the Greek letter nu. This is not a very good looking nu, it's just the, the one that I was able to get from my font choices. Nu is actually a little curvier than this. Okay? The unit is the hertz which is a one over second per, per second. And I write that more often than I write hertz. It's just more useful because you can make it cancel. It's the number of waves that pass a given point per unit of time. Now the period is given the symbol capital T. That's your normal, regular old capital T. It's measured in seconds, and it's the time between two consecutive waves. So it's a time thing. That's why the capital T makes sense. We won't deal with period too much in this class. Okay, amplitude. Letter A, capital A. The unit's the meter. And it is the height of a wave, whether we're talking about up or down, because electromagnetic waves are perfectly symmetric, unlike water waves. Water waves can be quite unpredictable for electromagnetic waves always goes the same distance up that it goes down. And now one that's going to be very important for this class, and you're not going to encounter this in a lot of other places, but the concept of a wave number, which, and I'm, I was having a font issue here, it is new with a line across the top. Okay? Now, the unit is the centimeter to the minus one, which is called a wave number. And it is the number of waves per centimeter. Now what this is really a measurement of old school is the energy of a wave. Now people don't use this very much anymore unless they're working in certain areas of chemistry, especially uh, IR spectroscopy, where it is the unit that's always used. So I want to introduce it here, and we'll use it for a few things, just so that you're familiar with it. Okay. 
Now we're going to work on the assumption that I've told you all this because light is a wave. Well, maybe it's a wave. <laughs> it travels as a wave. Okay, so our electromagnetic spectrum. What we call radiation, which most of the time you just refer to as light, is a continuous spectrum. The speed of that is given the symbol C, that's a lowercase c, and this is what one of our spectrums would look like going from low energy, sorry, going from low energy to high energy. Now, radio waves are very low energy. Then we go micro, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, and finally gamma. And gamma is very high energy. Okay. So if you're a fan of Album of the Week, you know that we've talked about Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. 1973 album, truly just one of the seminal albums of the progressive rock movement, probably the peak of the progressive rock movement. I don't think that it really got much better than this album. And this very well-known classic album cover, I mean, you can get this on t-shirts at Kohl's. I still see kids walking around in these shirts. It was designed by Hypnosis. The problem is, it's wrong. You see the prism, and you see the rainbow, I use that term loosely, coming out on the other side, except it's not a proper rainbow. Okay, most of you are probably aware of that just by looking at it. So, student that, oh yeah, maybe I'm talking about the wrong stuff here. No. Student in the past did this diagram for me, which is what the album cover should have looked like, and it really is a nice representation of a proper continuous spectrum. Now, differences from the original album cover. One, the rainbow is upside down. Two, the bands of light were monochromatic in the upper level, meaning they were all the same color within the band. The red at one side and the red at the other side of that band was red. It actually changes. It's progressive. Okay, It fades from red into orange, and the orange fades into yellow. And it's impossible for us to just put a number down and say, this is where red begins and this is where red ends. It doesn't work that way. Also, the bands of light in this rainbow are not all of equal width, which they were in that other album cover. Okay? So this is a proper continuous spectrum. And I'm going to use the phrase continuous spectrum a lot. And that's the type of rainbow we're looking at here. Okay. So you kind of see a better representation of it here, where the colors just fade from one into the next. Now this is done by increasing frequency, frequency that's getting bigger, left to right, and red is the low energy end, and the violet or purple, if you're a Prince fan, is the high energy end. So the phrase red hot is a misnomer. Red is actually quite a cool color. Now, wavelength and frequency are related to each other. Hopefully you're remembering that from last year. In general, in the physics class, we say the velocity of a wave equals its wavelength times its frequency, V equals LF. But we use specific symbols when we're talking about light. We say C equals lambda nu. That's the equation for today. Remember that one. So C equals 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second doesn't change, that's the speed of light. And don't forget that a hertz is a one over a second or a per second. So lambda is in meters. Hertz is in one over seconds, and that's how we get meters per second for the speed of light. All right, a couple of review math problems there for you to try, okay? If you have problems with them, let me know, okay? Then we'll continue on with stories about a guy named Max Planck. Now, Planck was a fascinating character. Born in 1858, died in 1947, German. He started out in the fields of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics and stumbled into what we're talking about today quite by accident, okay? Go just start at Wikipedia and you'll probably want to end up getting a biography of him because he's really an amazing character. So, what he ended up doing for us 
is this statement, the energy of electromagnetic radiation is always proportional to a specific number. What we say today is that it is quantized, okay? This is like buying ice cream at Rite Aid. You can buy one scoop, you can buy two scoops, you can buy three scoops, but you can't get one and a half scoops. It doesn't work that way. So because of that, all right, we say that ice cream comes in quantities of the scoop. And Planck said that energy came as a multiple of a specific number. Now what that means to us is that light or any electromagnetic radiation is a particle because it's quantized. Now he presented this on December 14th, 1900, the German Physical Society, and not as a new discovery. He presented it as a question, okay? He said that I have been able to figure out that the energy of electromagnetic radiation always follows this idea E equals H nu. You take the frequency and multiply by a constant. That would be like the scoop of ice cream. Now, today we call that Planck's constant. The H has a value. It's, of course, you know, put on the test for you. But what he said was, based on my work, you know, looking at different equations that we use to predict the energy of radiation, I've actually discovered it's a lot simpler than we thought it was. And he says, but it doesn't make any sense to me because I know that light is a continuous spectrum. And here we're saying that it is based upon multiples of one number. So he was asking the people at the meeting to tell him where he went wrong. And what everyone started saying was, well, it's wrong, but it fits the data. And we can't ignore it because it fits the data. But it really took five years for this idea to get uh, any real endorsement, okay? And just in case you were wondering, the value for Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. Although at the time he wasn't doing it in joules, he was doing it in ergs, which that's an antiquated unit. So it had a slightly different value. Okay, so now there's a great stamp here actually showing Planck's equation. And it's worth us noting that we really should be talking about delta E's because energy is a state function. Okay, I was always impressed that this stamp got that right. So that was our first quantum hypothesis, December 14th, 1900. Okay, a couple of review math problems here, very similar to stuff that you uh, did last year. So give them a try, check with me uh, if there are any issues about that. Okay, now the endorsement that Planck needed came in 1905 from Albert Einstein in one of the three seminal papers that he published that year. He explained something that we knew about called the photoelectric effect using Planck's equation. Now this is the actual work that Einstein got the Nobel Prize for in 1921. You have to remember that discussions of relativity were still very controversial. So the Nobel Committee had to decide what they could give him the prize for, and they ended up doing it based on photoelectric effect explanation. So we've known the photoelectric effect for basically 20 years at this point. Okay, Heinrich Hertz observed it. He had no explanation of what caused it. He just knew that visible light, if you shined it onto an active metal, lithium, sodium, potassium, you're not going to use iron or aluminum, but you have one of those really active uh, group one metals. You could cause it to ionize with visible light. Now, red light wouldn't do it. White light was great at it. Red light wouldn't do it. Uh, and as you went up to the higher end of the spectrum, higher energy end, the electrons were not only ejected, but they were ejected with even more energy. On this stamp that you're looking at, 
all those straight lines represent vectors. And these are energy vectors for electrons that are leaving. And the ones that are being hit there by the blue or violet light are leaving with much more energy than over in the yellow or the orange range. The amount of science on this stamp is stunning. It is truly a brilliant stamp. Okay, so how did Einstein explain it? He said that light was made up of particles, kind of like cue balls if you're playing billiards. He says the uh, inspiration came from being at pool tables a lot of the time. And the cue ball, the white ball on the pool table, is the incoming light. And when it strikes another ball on the pool table, which would be the electrons, if it has enough energy, it causes that other ball to move. If it doesn't have enough energy, it doesn't cause it to move. Now, contrary to what you would probably believe, if you were using blue light that was bright, it really didn't make a difference from blue light that was dim. The only difference the intensity of the light made was how many electrons were ejected, not the energy with which they left were. So intense or bright light just means more photons. It doesn't change the energy of the photons coming in. So yet yeah, Einstein showed Planck was right based upon this idea. Okay. And it also verified our new idea that light is a particle at least when it's being emitted or absorbed, it's working as a particle. It's still traveling as a wave. Okay, so that's pretty much the uh, first lecture that I gave on this, if you missed it. So that should get you up to speed. And then we'll jump in with our next video to cover the next few pages. All right, I hope you enjoyed it all. This is Morgan, signing off.